All right, we got we got a review day. I have eleven sheets of oh. notes. I have oh. no. I want. I, 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 I right exactly. I'm not gonna have. I want that. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. I, I got it. I got a meal. I got a meal. All right, so we're going to review. We've, we've had thirteen classes thus far, and I thought it was a good a good place to break because the thirteen principles of faith are broken up into three different categories: uh, defining God, defining the Torah, and uh, defining the relationship. How does God and man, you know, do the dance of life? Um, the, we didn't cover the fifth ikar, which is going really included in defining God, but it's like, it's about davening. So it's, it's, it's kind of like on the cusp between. And, uh, after last class, I was thinking, oh, I don't want to make anybody into an apichorus. So I thought it was a good, into a heretic. So I thought it was a good idea to, to pump the brakes a little bit and do a little bit of a review. Okay. So we started off with the idea, started off in this class with the idea that God created the universe in order to teach us how to love. That God created God and created the neshamas, and we were all just kind of wigging out. You know, what what is this God entity that loves us? It lacked context. And a nice way of thinking about it is, you know, imagine walking on the street and some weird stranger just like comes up from behind you and gives you a hug and says he loves you. Oh. That's a stalker. You call the police. Okay, so the, the way, this is an idea that's kind of developed by the, the Ashlag and his Rebbe, the Ramchal. And the way the Ramchal kind of uh, uh, defines this sort of, this sort of setup is it's like a, a, it was like an unearned experience. And I was thinking about it, you know, this sort of idea of unearned. And a lot of people use this metaphor of, you know, how would you feel if someone let you win chess every single time? I don't think that's such a, I mean, it captures part of it, this sort of idea of unearned love or unearned you know, a relationship, but I think a, a broader, I think more of an accurate way of looking about it is, well, if you haven't done anything with your life, well, you're not really an individual. Like, there's nothing to you, essentially. Just being created, having done nothing, by definition means you are nothing. So isn't, it isn't exactly right, this, this metaphor of some creepy guy coming up behind you and giving you a hug. It's more like you're the thing that's creepy because there's nothing to you. Said. Yeah. So, so God says, okay, well, that's interesting. Is this plan's backfiring? So I better create a world. So we created a world in which the, the goal of creation <laughs> is to learn how to love. Love is complex. And I offered, I offered, this is this is not this is not me seen I, but I think it's a pretty good idea. I think you can break down love into seven components more or less comprising ideas of loyalty. You know, what does it mean to be with other people? As well as autonomy. What does it mean to be an individual? Being an individual in the sense of, well, we have to, like the, the difference between, you know, say loyalty and autonomy, I think could be summed up in, in how we help people, how we relate to people in a sense of, well, don't steal people's problems. At the same time, make yourself available in order to help people. And that's a balance that is very hard to walk. Another part of this is, is developing a sense of who are you when you're alone and who are you with people. You're very different based on who's around you, based on if you're alone. The other, the other part, the other way, the other aspect of love, let's say, is harm. Ideas of, of well, how, how, how don't you harm people? What's the limit of your obligation not to harm people? Because there's going to be some times you're going to have to hurt people. Well, where's that line? An idea of fairness. You know, what's fair? Is fairness more everybody should get equal? Or is fairness something based on, on, earned, on, on the earned result, on competency? And there is a mix between the two. You know, there are people who have unearned, uh, who haven't earned what would make their lives better. But man, they're suffering. You should give them something to help them out. I mean, this is, this is one idea of tzedakah. At the same time, we don't, you know, my, my, Rosh, my, my, my Rosh Kolel, Rav Berkowitz, you know, one time there was a collector at the door collecting money for the hospitals here. And I mean, they were, they're trying to afford beds. And she, you know, she gives the duck, and she kind of thinks like, well, like, why am I not obligated to give all my property that I don't need? I mean, like, I don't need my sofa. I have a bunch of chairs I could just sit at my table. You know, maybe I don't even need all the dishes I have. Maybe I can, I can get, so, I can pawn those off. Like, well, why, why can't? Why shouldn't I pawn off all my 
belongings I don't absolutely need to pay for beds for people who are dying, and they're dying. Well, there is an idea of be, you know, that, that what you have you know, is a consequence of it's earned, you know, it's competency, and, and more than that, that there is a sense of, well, you do also have to have kadima because you know, play that one out, if you give away all your property, well, you might start falling apart. You might become a liability to society that people have to raise money for. So there's a balance between you have to be a normal human being that's stable and thriving and, and you know, being with it, and at the same time, well, yes, you also have to give to people things that are also unearned. So there's a, there's a balance there. A part of love is authority, developing a sense of, of duty, developing a sense of self-sacrifice, having an awareness of something greater, and freedom. Freedom of, of the present moment, being able to, to project yourself into the future, see what the consequences of your actions are, to be a master of your destiny, ultimately. And this idea that freedom is something which has rules. You have to translate potential into something actual. Otherwise, you are not free. You've done nothing. And then this idea of sanctity, that there is, there is something about uh, specific actions or thoughts or places that are, are, are holy, that they are clean in this sort of spiritual sense. This isn't my list, but this is, this is something that, that uh, moral, philo moral psychologists put forward as, as a, uh, the biological underpinnings of love. I, th I, th you know, I, th I think that if that's, that's a good, that's a good uh, source as any of defining what love is, and just happens to be all of Torah, every single halacha, really just lines up to those broad categories. I suggested that the 13 principles of faith are, are that the Rambam was, was, was outlining. Well, those are the foundations of Judaism. It's kind of taking, well, this is what love is, and breaking down, being able to kind of direct almost our love research that we're doing in this life, uh, to, give it, to give it more direction, to give it more order. So it comes out that the 13 principles, like I, like I said, you know, they are broken up into three broad categories. The nature of God, that's where we've been playing up until now. The nature of the Torah. And what does it mean that God interacts with man? Those are the last, the last couple principles of faith. The Rambam, in his letter to Yemen, when they were suffering under religious persecution, he makes a weird point. You know, at the time, I, it took a long time for me to try and wrap my head around this. But he says that all religions are basically the same. And I was like, what? And he just kind of he doesn't really explain. It. He just kind of like drops that bomb and moseys on to the other, to the next, to the next topic. Um, and it wasn't until I saw you guys are familiar with Masilis Yasharim of the Ramchal. So the Ramchal actually wrote a. A book before that. It was the same book, just in dialogue form. So I, I really recommend you get this. This it's really cool because there are things that are in the dialogue form that he like uh, didn't expand on in the actual Masila Shasharim we all know and love. And so in the beginning, uh, the Ramchal makes he really spells out this idea that well, what Judaism is, is it's a system of making value judgments. So it, all of a sudden now the. It's Masilis Yisharim, but it's in the dialogue version. Okay. You, can, you can find that in, in uh, different bookstores. They have it. So it started, it's that, that idea started to help me kind of make more sense of what the Rambam was meaning by, well, all religions are more, are, are more or less trying to figure out, you know, these ideas, you know, what's God, what, what are the obligations we have, and how do we connect to a deity. I mean, all religions are doing that, but they do it in different measure. You know, th those... Another way of thinking about it, those seven factors of love, well, you have more of some and less of others, and that what makes a religion unique is the mixture of all those qualities in, in, the, in, in specific proportion. Fundamentally, what, what, uh, what makes Judaism its character most unique as opposed to all other religions, is that it, you know, looking at the name itself, you know, what is the name of Judaism actually? Well, it's Am Yisrael. And the, the definition of Am Yisrael means the people that will struggle with the divine. 
that will struggle with morality. And so I think it's like this idea that Judaism above all other religions recognizes that there isn't that there, that there is a struggle that needs to be done here, that these things aren't obvious, and that that perhaps the process of coming to truth, of realizing truth, is more important than the actual truths you, you, you arrive at. And I think that's one, one reason why, well, nobody ever ordered a fatwa on the Rambam, or why, you know, any other rabbi isn't, isn't uh, you know, attacked in the streets. Because you definitely have that. I mean, the history of Christianity is one bloody massacre after another. The history of Islam is the same way. They, they rigidly adopted one principle and took it to its ultimate conclusion, and anybody that was outside of that solution to life, well, we'll just knock them off. But Judaism doesn't have that. But we appreciate that there's a, there's a need to struggle with these ideas. We, we outlined the historical development of science, and we, we hung out here in Nerdland for a couple different reasons. One is just knowing, well, how did society develop? You know, because really it's only the past 500 years we've really been doing the scientific enterprise. You know, thinking scientifically is not human, funnily enough. I mean, it's gotten to the point now where, say, in, in, uh, in you know, quantum physics, where I was listening to a couple of professors talk about their experience teaching, and it's like, well, anything in quantum physics is immediately outside our ability to perceive and understand. It is outside our experience. So we might be able to observe the measurements on tools, but we don't, they've gotten to the point in the development of science where they don't understand what they're talking about, yet are still able to make technologies based on what they don't understand. So like quantum physics, you know, is one reason why you have barcodes in, in the store. You know, we, we don't know how it works, but we were able to create the barcode system based on quantum mechanics so that when you scan your item, the, it, the, the price shows up on the computer. So we, we obviously stumbled onto something, but we don't understand it. So we've only been doing this for 500 years. So that's number one. That's, you know, science, you know, another way of, of defining science, a better way might be science is the observation of the behavior of things. That is all science is. How do objects behave? And that we went through four different philo uh, 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 philosophies of science together and how each philosophy of science actually has, has assumptions which are not provable. You know, take as an example the mechanistic philosophy of science that, well, the world is made up of parts and the definition of truth is that you're able to uh, 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 replicate this machine and, and that's just how you look at the world. Whereas the contextual philosophy of science would say, well, no, the world is not made of parts. There, it's more holistic in the way it looks at nature. And that its truth criteria, what it defines as true, is, well, if it works, that's true. It's true enough. And so kind of knowing that, knowing that there's, there's these sort of unspoken assumptions in science, and knowing the limits of science. Again, science is only describing behaviors. Well, we immediately know what science is not doing. It is not describing meaning which is what we've been doing as people before the past 500 years, that we're, we're, we're creatures that sense meaning. And so what the Rambam was doing ultimately, why did he create the 13 principles of faith? You know, Judaism went on for thousands of years fine without outlining these principles of faith. So why, like, why did he decide to do it? Well, the answer was that during his time in history was the beginning, the rise of, of, of Greek rationalism, you know, the beginnings of science. You know, it's not exactly science yet, but it's definitely a different way of looking at the world than what preceded. And so the Rambam said, right, if this continues going on the way it is, at a certain point, people will cease putting enough meaning on their lived experience. It won't be scientific enough. And so what he did was he almost translated the experience of Amuna that didn't need to be defined because we just, we knew it, we felt it. He had to outline it in specific categories, giving them definitions for a scientific mind. 
So these 13 principles are what enable us to continue to believe in God ultimately because we've changed in the way that we, we, we look and think in the world. And the last idea on this, on this topic I, I shared with y'all is, well, uh, that, that, that it isn't just that si different philosophy of science have their own assumptions, but all of them are based on sort of these, these, these meta-values that the world does make sense, that there is order, there is, there is truth, no matter how you want to define it, there is a truth, and that man can actually discover it. And that these ideas actually snuck in to Greek thinking. Well, it was a part of it already there, but snuck into Greek, into Greek thinking because, well, it was actually the Muslims and, and, and the Jews later on that translated Greek philosophy, which had been translated to Arabic. All the original Greek versions of everything was destroyed and was, it was translated to Hebrew and then eventually translated uh, uh, from people like, say, you and know, the... found during the Crusades. It was well, sold. I mean, Ibn Ezra, one of the Rishonim, he was a rabbi, but you know, his day job was translating all these Greek works into Latin because he read Arabic. You know, he was he was he was from that neck of the woods, and then selling it. That's that was his day job. So there was already like the very beginnings of of science has these fundamental uh, religious beliefs to them. And then I more, more specifically defined, okay, great, well, if that's the case, well, how would we define the, the scientific thinking or, uh, of Judaism? And Judaism is, is, it seems to be very uh, phenomenological. It, it, it emphasizes the truth is what the human experience is. So we have a concept in halacha that, that we, we can only uh, decide uh, legal issues based on what you see. So I gave a funny example how we have a halacha, don't, don't eat bugs. You know, you have upstairs, you know, uh, you know, I noticed they got rid of the ants by the sugar and coffee area recently. Yay. Yay. So don't eat bugs. You know, like when you make a coffee, wait three minutes because there's for sure ants in that sugar and the ants will float to the top. So just like before you have a coffee, just give it a second. Pop them out. But, but, uh. Or make another cup of coffee without the sugar. That's the second option. But what? But what about what about all? Well, you know, well, we know based on science that well that our cups, whether they're ants in there or not, are filled with bugs, filled with these microscopic organisms running around in there. Why is it not forbidden to have a have have a normal cup of water? Well, the answer is you can't see them. Your lived experience does not interact with those bugs. But what's interesting is you have many, many modern day rabbis who say, well, if you take a microscope, I got my cup of coffee here, and I put it under a microscope, and I see, oh, there's a bunch of bugs. I can no longer drink this cup of coffee. But everything is made up of bacteria. Everything that's has bacteria. But I haven't good. experienced it, and that's the point I'm making. You have, to, you have to, in your experience, interact with it. It's not scientific data that we know to be the case. That there, that, that, Halacha operates under the assumption that it has to be what you experience in your life. That, that's its criteria of truth. Often, not all the time, but often in halacha. That's the criteria of truth. And I gave you all these different philosophies of science to kind of prove the point of, well, that's not crazy to posit that as truth. I mean, we have other sciences that are, like I said, so it's not crazy to say, hey, well, you know, another criteria of truth is what do you experience? That's truth. But also to kind of sense, well, they're also different. And, and, and why I think that Judaism is contextual, does it work? It's because sometimes it is necessary to adopt a philosophy of science that's more mechanistic. Sometimes it's, it's more effective to adopt a philosophy of science that's more phenomenologically based. There is that feel to Judaism. There's an emphasis on it's got to work. How's that going for you is a very important question in Judaism because action is what Judaism is about, moral action, in, in, allowing there to be the manifestation of truth in what you physically do. Behavior is important. That is how behavior is looked at in Judaism. You live truth. You don't just know it. It doesn't serve you any good to just know truth. And there are many, many different, uh, f uh, really interesting things, you know, uh, different uh, statements of Chazal, of this idea of you know, a person who only studies but doesn't teach. 
a person who only learns the information but doesn't live it or give it, you know, make it make it come out of him in 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 a, in a relationship with others. Well, you, basically, you're promised to go crazy. You're labeled as selfish. Data in of itself floating up in the sky is is not just meaningless but is bad, according to Judaism. It has to be lived. Is the point. put forward, you know, kind of clearing that all up, fine, we have the 13 principles, okay, we're translating Amuna to the modern man to, to apply to life. Well, now we're starting to get into, well, what, what is our experience? What are the problems of life that we're facing from a Jewish perspective? And fundamentally, you know, the problem of life is that we're all limited. We can only see parts of reality. We don't have the full picture. And the solution Judaism offers is this idea of struggle, that, that a part of the reason why you're struggling is because you can never have the entire picture of reality. And that it's despite that, despite you'll never be able to know everything, you still are trying to transcend your nature, that you're going on a hero's journey. Going from the known, you're going from your known life and trying to expand your boundaries into the unknown. And the way you know you're doing that, again, experientially, is are you feeling a little concerned, a little unhinged, a little, a little sense of danger? When, when you are learning something new, there is this sense of, wait a second, what does that mean? Now, I'm not saying you know, that you have to be pushing yourself religiously to the point that you're going nuts, like, don't do that. But, I mean, even something as simple as fun, you know, what's the definition of fun? Fun is a little dangerous. That's the definition of fun. Otherwise, it's not fun, it's boring. That's what makes fun, fun. Otherwise, you know, like say in your, in your learning, if you feel like you're just skimming, if you feel it's just like, yeah, I've seen this before, well, you're not, you're not transcending. You're not walking on that hero's journey, trying to reveal the unknown. Because you are bored, it's, it's, it's lacking, it's lacking a, any sort of excitement to it. So you have to have that edge in your, in your religious journey, otherwise you're not doing it. So this, this brought us to the first ikar. All well, that's kind of the introduction to the 13 principles of faith. So many pieces of you're like, oh, that's just the introduction. That's just the introduction. We've like 30 Dude, we've had 13 classes, and we've <laughs> only done, what, three and a half, four? Yeah. So the first, the first principle is knowing God exists. It's about the existence of God. God exists. So the way the Rambam understands this, actually, this, 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 uh, this mitzvah is a commandment to prove God exists to yourself. Chakira. And the Rambam, when we first tackled this, this first ikar, you know, what we, we have to keep under, under, you know, keep in our pockets is that not doing any of these means you fundamentally don't exist in Olam Haba. This is like, this is the bare minimum. If you don't do any of these, you're done. And it's not because you're bad. The Rambam's idea of reward and punishment, he doesn't really have a classic idea of reward and punishment. It's like, there's a certain limit you need to reach in your own development in order to sense God and understand love. And if you get to that point, then when you die, you'll be able to observe it. It's, it's kind of like that, that grill experiment I mentioned to you. You have to know what to look for to see it. So if you don't know what to look for, you can't see it. That's how the Rambam looks at reward and punishment. It's not you're bad, you're good. It's do you know how to see? And from there, all the other 613 commandments then are, okay, good, now at least you can see. Now let's get specific. How, how much more detailed, how much more sophisticated can you become? That becomes the second stage for the Rambam. So it begs the question, well, wait a second, like, well, how, how can so much be writing on this? I mean, 
What about, you know, these you know, people who've, they've never heard of God, you know, these people living in the Congo. Well, what about them? Like, they don't get a portion of the world to come? Like, is that really what we're, what we're saying here? So, yeah, that's kind of what we're saying. And I, and I kind of try to justify this. It's not a crazy idea. Um, you know, we see in, that, in, in psychology, there's been a lot of research that's been shown that on a, on a biological level, we are spiritual creatures. We, we all have an intuitive sense of awe, of, of, of religious experience. It's something that's built into us, quite honestly. And so it's not so unfair to then say, okay, well, if you have a religious experience, if you have a sense, maybe there's something bigger, well, go investigate it. That's the first obligation. That's the first mitzvah of the Torah. That is the obligation of Chakira, proving God exists. And the Rambam goes on to say, you know, it's, it's, it's more than that. In fact, these first, these first several principles of Judaism are things you actually can prove outside of having a Torah. And he even sources himself in, in non-Torah sources, you know, drawing from Aristotle and Plato and Plotinus and all these guys, demonstrating people who were very much detached from Judaism actually also arrived at these, these, these true principles of describing God. It can be done. It's like that, was, that is the example of the Congo. The Greeks did it. Why can't you? That's basically the Rambam's, the Rambam's way of thinking here. There's an alternate opinion from the Tosh Betts and Rabbeinu Kreskis. They do, they do disagree. They say, listen, you know, it's kind of, that's kind of not fair. People, uh, you know, so much riding on having a, a state in Olam Haba. And, and Rabbeinu Kreskis, more than the Tosh Betts, he, 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 he kind of, he develops this idea of, well, free, you know, free will in many ways is determined by what you already know. If you believed that the world is flat, well, if you're going to go on a sea voyage, there will be a certain point you will say, time to turn back, guys. I don't want to fall off the edge. There's no free will to say, well, let's just keep going, unless you're suicidal. But there's no really any, any, any motivation to continue going. What you believe limits the, the choices you make. And so Urbana Kreskis counters, well, it's kind of not fair, Rambam. That, well, there are, there, it's, it's not so obvious, or maybe it's too difficult, even though you might be able to prove and it's true what you're saying, it might still be too difficult for most people. And I just wanted to present that, that, that uh, those views as well within Judaism, that it, this is, this is an one, str one religious struggle of many. Another part of this first Ikar was, was outlining the idea of things that Hashem can't do. The Rambam believes Hashem must be him. Hashem must be Hashem. That's the only thing Hashem has to, that's the one rule he has to keep. He can't, he can't be anything else. He's got to be Hashem. Does anyone argue with him on that? That's Rav Moshe Teku. Moshe Teku is like so right and so annoying. Rav Moshe Teku argues. Rav Moshe Teku's position Rav is... Rav Moshe Teku is really not having any of what <laughs> You know what? I feel like, like half the time I really agree with him, but he's just so annoying for the sake of the class. Mm-hmm. Moshe Teku argues. I mean, this is the... Ra the, 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 the Rambam spells out quite Rav clearly. Yeah, God, God, God has exactly. to be God. So if God has to be God, that means God... He... He, it, by free will, he, he creates. God has to be God. He can't contradict himself. If he's going to make a world, that's the way it's going to be. God can't kill himself. He, he can't contradict the fact that he has eternal existence. God must be God. Whereas Ramosha Teku counters, no, God can do anything. God can create the rock that cannot be lifted and then lift it up, and he can take a vacation to Hawaii and decide to commit suicide there, but then get up the next day for work. That's his position. And it seems to be that, that the fundamental conflict between these two views is on the paradox that surrounds the relationship between man and God. And another paradox of, well, what is, what is, what is free will? What is choice? What's, what's the free will of Hashem? 
So for the Rambam, the paradox the Rambam can't get out of, which I think he actually does, is Hashem, how is it the Hashem which is unknowable, which is, which is not what he created? Well, how can that have a relationship with limited created beings? Where's the, where's, by, by, what, by what mechanism, by what tool, in what way can these two things talk to each other? I mean, for goodness gracious, I mean, men and women are, are not so different. They are different, but they have a hard time communicating with each other a lot of times. So like, kol shekane God with man. So that's the paradox that the Rambam's left with. The paradox that Moshe Teku has is the paradox, well, uh, that, that is a paradox of Hashem's essence. He can do anything. Well, that's, that's absurd. God can't kill himself and then be alive. Like, that just doesn't go. So that's, that's one, one outcome of this, of this dispute. The other, like I said, is free will. You know, how much does, or what is the free will of Hashem? So for, for, for Moshe Teku, he defines free will as the ability to do anything. The free will is potential, ultimately. Whereas for the Rambam, what it means to be free is to actualize something, to actually have made a choice and to create it and have it stand and be. That's what free will is. We outlined, you know, in the spirit of Chakira, of proving the existence of God, I, we, what we did, I outlined the, the three different proofs for the existence of God with a bit of a preface that, you know, proofs do not inspire belief. You know, Bless you. I agree. Proofs do not inspire belief. I've never met anybody who has said, you know what, I believe God exists because I read Descartes. Haven't met that guy. I think Immanuel Kant had, he was onto something and that's why I believe in God. Like, there, such a person doesn't exist. Wait, can you say that proof doesn't what? Proof does not make people believe in God. What proofs do, they make our understanding of God more sophisticated. That's probably the most you can get out of a proof. And I, I think it kind of, it, it might also be like a, a, a mental, um, oh, what is it, you know, what, 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 what's the word? It's on the tip of my tongue. You know the, these pictures you see where they, they, um, they um, illusion. illusion, thank you. I think it's a mental illusion. Thank you. You're on the ball. It's a mental. I think that that proofs oftentimes are mental illusions because we do have a biological ingrained um, um, sense of 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 the spiritual, and so when offered a proof, it's almost like ah, okay, that makes sense. It it draws into line what's already there and brings it out. I think that's what a proof does. Okay, but so, well, yeah, a little, a little bit. But I, what, what I also kind of offered in, uh, when we were co when we were covering, covering this is that well, that's also the downside of proofs is that we are <laughs> fundamentally flawed beings that go in and interpret the world in funny ways. We have confirmation bias. Maybe, you know, the the proof is so unique it doesn't actually measure up to what we already know, and so the proof won't work. It's outside of our our current state of understanding. Um, it might not speak to our philosophy of science. You know, you, got, you might be a mechanist and you're being given a philosophy of science that's contextual based. And again, like the, the, the definition of truth is different. So it won't speak to you. Uh, more than that, we're, we're complex beings. We're not just, we're not just, you know, we don't just have thinky thoughts. We have feelings. We have bodies. <laughs> And thoughts. thinky thoughts. And, and proofs usually are tapping into the thinky thought land. And that's not, that's not, that's not who we are. Fun so, there's, so, there's a, the, yeah, so there's a sense of a proof missing something because it's only talking to one part of you. And, and uh, it gets even worse that, that our, our ability to access what we know is emotion state dependent. If you are in a bad mood, you will only be able to, re to remember with clarity all the things that have ticked you off. But you will not be able to be able to draw so clearly any memory that was happy. So when you're ticked off at your spouse, 
good luck remembering your wedding day. You'll just be too angry to remember that because, God willing, when you guys get married, you'll actually be enjoying yourselves. So you'll only be able to remember that memory with clarity when you're in a good mood. So the state you are in emotionally will either make a proof sound reasonable or ridiculous. We're limited creatures. So with that preface, we got into, well, what are the basic proofs for the existence of God? We covered the theological argument, which is the argument from design, where basically the idea of this proof is you look into the universe and you see the entire universe is, is highly functional, it's interconnected, it's based on laws, there is a designer. It, and it's not just this idea of, you know, the, the metaphor often used in the, in the design argument is, you know, imagine yourself walking in a field and you find a, a watch. And you would automatically say, hey, this watch is owned by somebody. Someone obviously made this watch. You would never think ever that this watch just happened to come out by accident. That's not the full picture of the design argument. The design argument is really saying, yeah, okay, yeah, you're in that field. And you find that watch. But surrounding that watch is grass, and grass follows rules. How does grass grow? We got you know, all the biological processes that make grass grow, and there's the dirt, and, and that has rules. And it's, it's an argument that's a proportional argument. It's not just some things look like they have a design. It's like everything looks like it has a design. Everything looks like it's, it, it, it is made to do something, and it works that way, and it works in a very complex way. And even more than that, it's not, it's not just things operate under, under, under a design of rules, but it's so complex. This design is so good. You as a human being can see it. That just adds another complexity of design. There is a, a sense of self that, that creation is almost self-aware through your eyes. You see it makes sense. Because a lot of times, there, you know, uh, the, the major criticism that atheists have against Judaism, you know, or religion in general, if you start reading, you know, Stephen Do uh, uh, um, um, Richard Dawkins and, and people like that, is, well, they kind of say, well, you know, religion is really, uh, religion uh, is a God of the gap sort of thing. That, you know, God is found in that gap between what can't be explained and what we observe. And, well, this, this argument is like, no, actually, we want to resolve all, all those gaps. The more we uh, describe the world scientifically, the more we have, uh, the more data we have, and the more theories that work out, the more complex our technology and science becomes, the more proof God exists. So that's the first argument. The second was the cosmological argument, where it is basically appreciating this idea as well, we see there's a cause and effect in the world. And because the universe is limited in time, there is, we, we know as a, as a cosmological certainty, there is no infinite amount of time in the universe. There is a big bang, and we have the second law of thermodynamics, like this show runs out. So given there are causes, given there is a beginning point, we just kind of like look at all the, look at all the, 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 the causes and effects that ever came to, and you, you, you are faced with the reality there must have been a first cause to start the whole show off. Taking these two proofs together, we start forming a picture of, well, okay, that, those are, these are reasonable arguments. Give, given that's true, well, what would that mean about God? Well, we have a created world that has order. It must be God's intelligence. God wants creation to be. He made it happen. He was the first cause. Well, Hashem must have choice. He made a world, made a universe, at least the way that we experience it, is everything is an ethical, moral question. That underlies every story, every play, every, every sports game. It underlies this, there is a good and a bad. Well, it's okay, so God must be ethical somehow. And, like I said, there are rules that, that you know, things, it's not arbitrary, you know, there's rules that in nature that they are the way they are, so okay, fine, there's, there's intention, there's a goal here that, that Hashem has. And this 
last idea of that, at least our experience of life, is that the world is actually getting better and better and better. The more that we team up and, and, and work together to make the world a better place. So that's why you, know, you look through a history of all of humanity, it is the graph is the steep line of we are living longer, we are suffering less from disease, there is less war, crime is has been constantly been 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 uh, in the decline since we started recording crime. I mean, murder rates are constantly, you know, are are getting you know better and better and better. You know, so like wow, like the world's getting better. What do you know? There's something to ethical action, being intelligent people making choices and believing we have free will, living an ethical life, having goals in mind that also somehow just make the world better. When we emulate God, the life is good. Not just for us, but for everybody. That's what, at the very least, we can take out of these, these two proofs. And if we don't, what are we left with? Well, we'd have to, if we don't want to take on these proofs, we'd have, at the very least, have to argue, well, you know, maybe there, maybe the universe is, it doesn't have rules. Maybe we only observe these rules in our universe, but maybe other universes and other galaxies, they have weirdo rules that we could never even fathom. That's silly. Okay, you can think that, but just be aware that's a silly thought. Uh, not, not... Not taking seriously these proofs, you know, you want to be an atheist, well, you're, you're going to have to tackle the fundamental problem of consciousness. How did rocks end up becoming thinking things that are aware of themselves? How does that one work? You know, I think, uh, Dennett, he's you know, one of the leading philosophers in the philosophy of, uh, of consciousness, is like, you read his works, I mean, he's an atheist, and, you know, fair enough, but like, as try as he might, the guy's not answering the question. He really is not answering the question, not even close. So you have to tackle that problem. How, do, how did rocks end up having feelings? They okay. tried really hard. They try, yeah, right, they tried really hard. A for effort. A for effort, rock. I think that this is being mainted by Rock Johnson. <laughs> of course he has feelings. Yeah. So the last, the last, the last proof of God, you know, because those other proofs don't exactly prove the, the, the Jewish version of God. You know, we might end up with an ethical God, great, but not necessarily the God of Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. So the last proof that, that exists was an argument of experience. The fact that, and I kind of broke this one up of, you know, a, a proof of experience being pragmatic, we see it works, or, you know, looking at the history of the Jewish people, or the personal meaning that we sense ourselves as being these three parts of such a proof. And so pragmatically, we see that, well, religion and, and Judaism also specifically, well, that creates stability and trust. Stability in the sense of that the Torah itself is outlining moral and ethical behavior. It's outlining the known that we can take into unique and crazy situations in our life. We have a, a road map of how to behave. And it helps us, kind of guides us, in these maybe terrifying, tough situations that we're confronted in life. That creates stability. It enables trust, you know, believing that, there's, that there are moral laws and we're all being held accountable to them. Well, people start acting more trustworthy. And I, you know, I gave an example of the, the Jewish diamond business. The overhead being in the diamond industry is insane because you're constantly worried someone's going to do you. Someone's going to steal your products. Someone's going to, I mean, God, man, my, my wife had a friend who, he was in the diamond business. He was actually kidnapped and killed. It's dangerous. It's dangerous work. But, when, but in, the Jew, in the Jewish diamond industry, they have almost no overhead. You know, they're dealing with the Jews. They know they can trust each other. They invest very little and make a lot compared to everybody else. There's trust between people that's created. And the psychological gains, you know, just being, living a religious life, being religious, believing you have free will, actually makes it that you are less likely to be depressed. It makes you less likely to suffer from anxiety. It makes it less likely you'll kill yourself. It makes it more likely that you're gonna be satisfied with your life. Chances, chances are less likely you're gonna get a divorce. It's more likely you're gonna enjoy being married. I mean, like, you know, the, the last, the, the most recent statistic on, on marriage satisfaction is like only 20% of people like being married. So it's like being religious kicks that one up a bunch of notches. You have a more functional family life. 
You try harder, you actually make more money. Believing you have free will and you're a master of your own destiny and what you do matters. So there's a pragmatic aspect. And, and all these things are kicked into overdrive because, well, what Judaism is, you know, the halachic system, the belief that, that there is a right and wrong, there is a good and bad in behavior, means, well, every detail matters. You know, up to the point of what's the quality of your Natilis Udayim cup? That matters. Because there's a sensitivity that everything you do matters. And it really does. The more meaning you have in life, the more trust you'll have for others, the more stability you'll have in your life, the more direction you'll have. And the more, it's almost like this paradox of the more responsibilities you take on, the better your life becomes. The fewer responsibilities you take on in life, the more in hell you are. The history of the Jewish people, the idea that we're, we're a nation that survives. Again, another proof. That's, that's again, from experience that you know, we're, the, we're the only ancient peoples that existed, and we're going to continue existing. There's something about a religion that is designed to last. That's worth noting. You know, Carl Jung said about the Jewish people, that what we ended up doing was we took our unconscious and made it conscious. That, we, made, that we, we took on a mission of life, that we are constantly revealing and clarifying our moral obligation to the point where we're taking what is infinite and making explicit. That was great. Just like, just like, that just floored me. It's such a great definition of Jewish people. That is what halacha is. You know, getting, getting, getting lost in thinking the details don't matter. At the same time, you're... you're at that same moment, almost buying into this idea of what you do doesn't matter. Because it's like, it's all or nothing. Either what you do matters or it doesn't. Like you can't have both. And so if what you do matters, well, guess what? The way you tie your shoes matters too. That's just the way it is. So make your choice. And then there was this idea, this, this last idea I gave for you guys, was this idea of, well, you know, national revelation. This idea of, we, and you could read, you know, the, Rabbi Kellman has, has books on this, you know, Rav Gottlieb has books on this, this idea that, that there's no other religion in human history that, has, that can claim that the entire nation saw the, the moment of revelation. Okay, you can agree with it, disagree with it. What I liked about this, what I kind of took from this, from this observation, was it's almost as though we offer it innocently because we're not a missionizing religion. It would make sense, you know, if, okay, fine, if this is a game, if we're trying to get, get new members to join, we'd want the best argument that God exists. Well, there's no better argument than, than that. Everyone saw it. It's not a conspiracy. You know, you, a conspiracy of three can't maintain itself. Well, how can a conspiracy of three million maintain itself? So, okay, that would make, that'd be a good argument to have in your pocket if you were a missionizing religion. But Judaism isn't a missionizing religion. We, we observe this fact innocently. As with no implication. It's like, yeah, and this is also this is a part of our history. What's for dinner? And it's the innocence of it that that makes it more compelling in, in as far as our experience of it. I think we got to class five. We have a couple more classes to review, but, but that's what we're holding, that's what we're holding up thus far.